papers out, all ready to go. Number two, I think um, I think I got some feedback yesterday that my quiz was a little too hard, so it's a little easier maybe, but no promises. <coughs> so this is your quiz question number one. It has to deal with the anatomy of the iris and the pupil. And it is important to know what you're looking at and what is normal. So the question here is, and it's even multiple choice, so it's a little easier, I think. Um, is what is the normal location of the center of the pupil compared to the center of the iris? Is it inferonasal? Is it supranasal? Is it inferotemporal? Or is it superotemporal? Does anybody know? Yeah? Well, I mean, did you answer it on your piece of paper already? You got it? Does anybody know? C. No. Uh, it is inferonasal, and it's unfortunately no rhyme or reason. It's just kind of where mostly anatomically things end up. So just important to know when you're looking at a normal iris and normal pupil, you're going to have some displacement um, from the center of the iris of the center of the pupil. Question number two. So I want you to list three signs of Horner syndrome other than meiosis, ptosis, and anhydrosis. And I think I could think of maybe eight. So you get three. Not too bad, right? So I'll give you uh, 15 seconds. Seconds left. Okay, there we go. You ready? Can somebody scream some out for me? Huh? Huh? Sorry? <gasps> Perfect. That's a good one. Anything else? Come on. Nothing? No, no, that's not a sign. Well, what is happening? How about pseudoanalphalus? That's a really great one. What is happening? Your, 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 uh, your, uh, your flag presentation having a seizure because it's too stressed. <laughs> All right, so this is a list, right? So um, again, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, your classic medical school teaching. You're not in medical school anymore. You're ophthalmologist, so you should have a bigger list of things that are associated with Horner syndrome in terms of the signs. So dilation lag is like your classic, classic thing we talk about with Horner syndrome, so really important to think about that. Um, reverse ptosis, of course, is associated with the um, sympathetic innervation of the inferior eyelid retractors, uh, which is equivalent to the Mueller muscle in the upper lid, so it's a reverse ptosis. And as Dr. Warner had mentioned, it gives you an appearance of pseudoanophthalmos. When you do your exophthalmometry, of course, it is not the case, and uh, that's why it's called pseudoanophthalmos, but the appearance of the ptosis and reverse ptosis gives you that sunken eye uh, look. The conjunctival hyperemia is really important as well, and that's just related to the removal of the sympathetic tone of the muscle, of the vessels. And so a lot of the time, what patients end up being treated for um, when it's not picked up correctly is for um, some kind of you know, corneal or dry eye or infection or allergic reaction in the eye because that eye just looks red. So unless you pick up the subtle ptosis and subtle um, anisocoria, um, they can't end up being treated for anterior segment problems, which are not anterior segment problems. So again, really important to keep in mind uh, when you're looking um, at somebody with unilateral red eye and maybe some other neurological symptoms. Um, iris heterochromia is, is also an important sign. It is uh, traditionally thought of as a congenital 
um, uh, Horner syndrome sign. And um, it, is, it develops in children because if, parasympath if, sorry, if sympathetic innervation is disrupted um, at the time where the uh, melanocytes produce pigment and um, deposit pigment in the iris, uh, you basically get anisocoria. So if you have a, a unilateral Horner syndrome, you get anisocoria, and the iris that is lighter is the one that is the abnormal iris. And classically, the um, timing for that is thought to be probably up to two years of age. So um, there's been some studies done on um, kind of the development of the color of the iris in children, and up to two years is when you can actually have development. So even if you have, a, theoretically, even if you have acquired Horner syndrome after one year of life, then you still could end up with um, uh, iris heterochromia. Again, abnormal iris is the, the lighter one. Um, the sympathetic innervation is required for melanocytes to produce pigment. Um, you can get transient increase in accommodation because that's, of course, you just get the parasympathetic drive um, as your sympathetic drive is impaired. Um, again, temporarily transiently, you can get um, reduced intraocular pressure for the same reason. So has anybody heard of Harlequin sign or what that is or Harlequin syndrome? Nico, you were? Yeah, very good. Yeah, so that again is one of the findings. And would it be, um, which side would it be the Horner syndrome on? So, so Kristen, what side would it be the, would the Horner syndrome be on in Harlequins? Sorry? The normal side, correct. So again, think that that's actually the opposite side, and, and but the, the sign is called for the facial flushing. And then we don't quite understand why, but there's some kind of like sympathetic input towards um, your hair being curly, like if you're naturally curly, and if you remove um, sympathetic input, you actually get like a straight, you know, half the, the hair straight or some part of the hair is straight and the other side is curly. So um, I really don't know the explanation. I don't know if Dr. Warner, you have heard of why that's the case, but um, I don't think we've figured that out yet. No? Well, uh, they do say that, you know, they scared me so much it made my hair curl. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> All right, so um, there's uh, a case. So we have a 63-year-old patient, and um, she came into clinic uh, just last month with um, a two-and-a-half-week history of um, anisocoria, and the anisocoria was greater in the dark. So uh, I am going to get one of the maybe PGY-2s to uh, describe to me what you see. So this is a photograph of our patient um, in a room light and she's looking far away. She's looking at distance. <laughs> well, you know, we traditionally beat up our patients in your ophthalmology clinic. So. <laughs> All right. Chris? So, color photo, uh, both eyes in room light. You can see uh, left eye, upper eyelid has some stenosis. I don't know. Yeah, compared to the left eye, again, it's a reasonably small amount. Oh, in the right eye, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, left eye is uh, lot, very much a lack of injection. Anything else that you think is in the photo? In that left eye right there. Good. So, what's the MRD you I just estimate? And then what do you think of the, of the right? Right, maybe four and three and a half. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So that gives you two signs of Horner syndrome. 
So we got ptosis and? Yep. Yep, reverse ptosis, good. That's, that's pretty good, right? So uh, apparent anophthalmos, I think, is a really nice um, uh, thing that's uh, exemplified here. It just looks like that eye is sunken because of that appearance of the ptosis and reverse ptosis. So, but, you know, you, you know I already told you, right, that the ensochore was uh, greater in the dark, so you kind of have your uh, differential narrowed down a little bit. But, you know, it also helps you, again, just that subtle ptosis, reverse ptosis, apparent anophthalmos, um, and uh, you have the anisocoria and uh, you put it together. Um, one thing she does not have, she doesn't have iris heterochromia, so uh, you probably, it's not congenital and she's got the ecchymosis around there, so something must have, must have happened to her. Second, so, one quick question, is yep. her eyelash on the left side? More curly? <laughs> well, it no. almost looks cut, but I can't tell if that's just case. No, I think it's just, yeah, they're right there. It's just the darker background, you don't see them as well. Um, and uh, so then this is a, a picture of the same patient, and this is her um, looking at near. So you're basically looking to um, constriction to near, and, and she had that. And um, then uh, here is a photograph of um, exposure, light exposure to the right, and you're looking for a kind of consensual response, and if that, uh, and that is indeed present. And um, then, then we did this. So the light is turned off. This is five seconds. This is 15 seconds. What do you see there? Five seconds, 15 seconds. Very good. So this is a, a sign um, call, of Horner syndrome called dilation lag. And um, again, a really nice um, thing to look for because it really, you can even avoid, you know, in this patient, it's kind of classic. You've got your ptosis, you have your reverse ptosis, you have your anisocoria, you have your dilation lag. So you're getting the idea that this is Horner syndrome. And um, in, you know, in majority of cases, actually, it's pretty convincing. So even drop testing is not necessary. And we actually didn't do drop testing in this patient because I think all the signs were pointing to um, Horner syndrome. And this patient actually had a, th a surgical resection of her thyroid, and she developed a really large hematoma on her neck, and uh, supposedly that was compressing um, her um, uh, sympathetic pathway. Um, I will have to caution you, I do remember seeing one case in residency um, where a patient had had a tumor resection in her neck and she developed Horner syndrome afterwards. And um, you know, it's easy to assume, well, this is just post-surgical changes, uh, nothing to worry about. Um, and this was about probably six weeks after she had had her resection. Um, but we, you know, there were some other things going on, so we decided to re-image her, and she actually had recurrence of that tumor in the short period of time in the same area, uh, compressing her sympathetic chain. So um, just, just beware of, you know, looking for other things and not just um, discounting things to post-surgical changes because multiple things could be going on in the same, same patient. So we actually uh, offered this patient uh, repeat imaging, but uh, she chose not to, um, to do that, and we're just going to observe her and just make sure that um, she does well. And how, when was the surgical plan compared to the development? Yeah, it was about like four weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, like three or four weeks and ago. And like this injury, obviously, was just a red herring. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think this is probably f maybe post-surgical or something like that. I don't know where they went into it, but the, the ecchymosis had no relevance to, well, it had relevance because of it was post-surgical, but it wasn't a traumatic um, event or anything like that. Okay, so um, the next case is a three-month-old um, baby, and uh, the parents bring him in because about uh, uh, one and a half weeks ago, they noticed uh, anisocoria. And uh, so maybe uh, we'll get Nico to comment on what you see here.
And uh, I always, you know, it's sometimes important to mention pertinent negatives in this case. So what are pertinent negatives in this case? I know, you know, the upper eyelids seem symmetric, there's no ptosis. Very good. Uh, lower eyelids as well. Um, what other signs of Horner did we talk about that he does not have? Look at his face. So it doesn't have any asymmetry in the flushing, right? So that's important to note. And, you know, stepping back, even before you think about something like Horner syndrome, it, he does have anisocoria. So what's another important pertinent negative that is nicely exemplified with the corneal reflexes in this photograph? Symmetric. Yeah, so they're, they're central and there's no uh, apparent um, uh, deviation. So presume that this child did have right Horner syndrome, right, have a little bit of meiosis on the right. Um, would we expect iris heterochromia in this child? I don't know if it's, it'll show that three months. Early. Yeah, three months. No, so as I mentioned, right, so it, well, it usually takes about six months for it to become apparent, but up to two years um, sometimes. I guess it depends on the natural pigmentation, right, so on the child. Um, okay, then this is the uh, room in the light. This is the dark room photograph. Nico? So, uh, you know, again, my attention is drawn to both pupils. There seems to be anisocoria uh, from the left greater than the right in the dark. Uh, to me, I see a little bit more asymmetry, um, maybe around one millimeter difference uh, between the two. So I would say it's anisocoria greater in the dark. Yeah, we actually didn't think that it was um, that different. It was probably less than a millimeter, about a millimeter or so or less, and it was relatively symmetric, and we we're comfortable because there was no ptosis, um, no other uh, concerning findings. So uh, we uh, are going to be watching this little guy, and uh, he uh, thought we thought he had physiologic anisocoria. So we have question three from uh, your quiz, and again, it's a multiple choice. Yeah, sorry, yeah, he's, uh, the, the, the parents had looked at the photos and he's had it since, since birth, so. Or at least, uh, like, at least the first month for sure. <coughs> All right, what's the answer to this one? It is C, and um, concern with um, apoclonidine and bromonidine um, is what? Yeah, CNS suppression. So we really uh, do not um, like to use um, any of the derivatives uh, in children, and depends on um, kind of the source you look at. Some sources say even up to eight years of age. Uh, majority of sources say maybe two years of age, and after that, um, it becomes relatively safe. Um, but it's just, uh, it just has to do with CNS penetration of both drugs in children as compared to adults. So um, do not, do not give uh, bromonidine or epiclonidine to children. Cocaine is actually safe uh, in children for testing. So what age? When, when is it safe to use epiclonidine? So like I said, um, so most sources say about two years, but some say up to eight. So I would just avoid it in children if you have access to cocaine in general. Um, I did want to mention uh, a little bit more about physiologic anisocoria. Um, you did mention a few points about it, but um, up to 20% of the population actually do have physiologic anisocoria and walking around with um, uh, you know, uh, uh, unequal pupils. Usually it's less than a half a millimeter difference, but classically we talk about less than one millimeter. And um, the amount can vary depending on time of day, and it can actually flip eyes as well. So um, you can see uh, that. Traditionally, anisocoria is the same in light or dark, but it can be more obvious in the dark, like in our baby, as you can see, just because dark conditions just makes things 
uh, a little, I guess, a little bit more obvious. So the um, confusion often comes in, especially when you have an older person with physiologic anisocoria and then they have maybe involutional ptosis. And so uh, drop testing is important in physiologic anisocoria. Um, in case you were wondering why would we test if all these features are present, um, it's not often uh, clear uh, as uh, can be. Okay, so here's a third one. Uh, this is a baby I saw, I think I was maybe a third or fourth year resident, um, and uh, mom sent me this, this picture. So what sign is this? Yeah. So what sign is the pathology on? Mm -hmm. So uh, theoretically, um, you, it should really help you localize where um, Horner syndrome is. Um, Chris, you seem to know kind of a little bit more about the anatomy of uh, facial sweating and no, no. Okay, <laughs> anybody? Why does that maybe help you localize things? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the way that uh, the uh, pathway uh, for um, basically vasoconstriction, vasomotor, and pseudomotor fibers. Uh, goes, it's a little bit different than your pupillary uh, sympathetic pathway and uh, very sim you know, similar, it just goes down a little further down the T um, uh, spine, but uh, when it travels to the superior cervical ganglion, it actually splits and uh, fibers uh, that uh, innervate the upper medial uh, forehead actually travel um, differently than do the fibers that innervate the lower face. So it kind of gives you um, an idea that, you know, if you have a bit of asymmetry, you know that if the whole face is affected, that it's likely either a first or second order neuron, but if it's um, just part of the face, like a superior uh, medial uh, forehead, then it kind of helps you localize things um, a little bit. Now, I have to say that. Um, in kids, there's been some publications about the fact that it's not necessarily true, and there, there's thought to be some um, transsynaptic degeneration that happens that we don't actually see in adults. So in adults, this may be helpful, but um, there's been several cases in children where a drop testing actually localizes to a different location than the, the facial asymmetry and the facial flushing. So um, I will have to caution you against that in uh, children. Um, in adults, it's a little bit more consistent um, in terms of um, kind of the, the asymmetry. Now, you did mention that we don't really test for anhydrosis. Um, you can, in children, especially if they cry, it's, it's actually, like in this case, um, kind of a nice example of how we can actually see, um, see the anhydrosis and the facial flushing that's asymmetric. Some people talk about using like a spoon or even like a prism in clinic and running it over the forehead and seeing the difference of how slick it is um, depending on the side of the forehead you're testing for. So, and I mean, I've, uh, uh, you know, I saw a patient with Harlequin syndrome, we actually made him run up and down the stairs just to see kind of where, um, to, to reproduce those signs. So you can do certain things to bring out um, and hydrosis and asymmetric flushing, um, you know, it is it's a little bit more effort. So maybe that's why we don't um, talk about it. Reliable, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <coughs> and um, so I, I just want to mention this because I, I knew we weren't going to talk about it too much in the um, the actual didactic portion of the talk. Um, is that um, you know like. If you think cornering children, like you got to think neuroblastoma, you know it, and it sometimes is difficult, especially if a child presents at two years of age, to know if it's congenital or acquired, especially if there's no history of birth trauma. So you really you you, you need to to think about that first. Um, and one other point I wanted to make here is the um, kind of the congenital side of things. Why would congenital agenesis of internal carotid artery um, cause Horner syndrome? Where does sympathetics go? You need that to kind of guide Correct. Them. So if you have developmental agenesis of, um, of uh, the uh, internal carotid, you're just not going to have your sympathetics travel um, to that area. So um, just, just, again, connection between what your causes are to the anatomical understanding of the pathway are really, really important. Okay. So... Um, Maybe 
Lee, do you want to describe this one? Three minutes. So there. Well, you know what? Actually, we're um, going to go to this. Um, this is one other thing that we did not cover that I wanted uh, to cover today. So I know he's telling you what is going on, but I did want you to. Um, no, I'm I'm not I'm I'm going to show you this. What 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 is he showing you that there? So the patient is uh, a common, uh, basically looking at near uh, evoking a near response. So what's happening there? No, nope. well, later, but, sorry? So he tries light first, that doesn't work. Then he tries near response, and that constricts the pupil. What's that called? Sorry? Yeah, so light near dissociation. Yeah, so light near dissociation. So this is your qu uh, quiz question four. And uh, what I want you to do, um, this is a, a little bit of help for you, but I want you to name an anatomic site and then etiology of causes of light near dissociation. And I want you to name five of those. seconds. Okay. Ready? Not really. <laughs> All right. So, um, the first set, of course, is, is retina. So, if you have severe retinal damage, that can give you light near dissociation because of the input effect. Um, short posterior ciliary nerves um, get affected in either PRP or peripheral neuropathies of different kinds that can give you light near dissociation. Um, as uh, Nico had nicely explained, um, Addy's pupil uh, site of pathology is ciliary ganglion, so uh, you need to know that. Uh, with cranial nerve 3, aberrant regeneration um, uh, can be a cause of light near dissociation, for example, when um, adduction is coupled with uh, meiosis, et cetera, uh, so um, that's important to know. Um, Argyle Robertson pupils localized to the tectum of the midbrain due to the inflammatory effect. And then, um, you know, we've seen a few cases of dorsal midbrain syndrome um, that uh, are due to either uh, tumors or hydrocephalus or other compressive uh, things. And qu quiz question five is um, two systemic findings in 80s pupil. This w was covered, so we should know that. Okay, and uh, a quick one here. This should just be a quick look. What's this? <laughs> Can somebody describe the photo quickly? Maybe Lee. Sorry, I took away your chance, so that's a chance to redeem yourself. <sighs> and uh, what's this sign called? <laughs> Like the toothpick sign or the Q-tip sign? Why, why is that there? Correct. So he's trying to elevate the lid. Eyes down and out, you have 
and a sequoria as expected. So um, as Nico quickly mentioned, you need to, to image this patient. And uh, this is the last one here. And um, this is a patient here uh, that um, has anisocoria that was greater uh, in a uh, lit room. And um, this is him right here. And this is him after installation first of dilute pylo and then second of 1% pylo. So what's your diagnosis here? OK. I'm always running out of time. But these are your quiz questions, and those are your points. And I will collect the scores. Um.